Okay, well, I want to um, I want to first say that um, these conferences, as everyone knows, come together uh, after a great deal of work has gone in, and and um, I'm making these presentations on behalf of my two co-organizers, who I'm going to take care of separately and privately. But there's somebody who was working this summer to get us all started, and he has done an extraordinary amount of work, and so. And uh, you've you heard of the, the National Press Club Mog and the Commonwealth Club Mog. <laughs> <laughs> the Rockefeller Institute. Thank you so much, Peter. You can't have a UN conference without two distinguished personalities from the United Nations. And so, Michael, I want to give this to you from us. <laughs> <laughs> and also. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making the record. Uh, to Albany. Um, we know the thing is sometimes people in New York think that Albany is somewhere, you know, uh, up in the mountains and all of that, but uh we wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we really do appreciate it. And and Kian, I personally thank you for making my life easier during the summer here and, and helping me in so many ways on this. And and also coming up with all sorts of creative uh, ways of addressing a lot of the changes that, that went along um, as we go along. So let's uh, now proceed to our, our last roundtable discussion on policy-oriented research and global public policy making. And, and you know, we've been you know, hitting at this uh, in a couple of ways already, talking about um, how uh, faculty members across SUNY could uh, engage the UN. We've heard about you know, research that we've been presented in here. How do we get that to um, the right people? So we have um, Colleen Thuez here who has been doing this and working with academics for a long time, has invited them like me to uh, back at uh, UNITAR in, in, in a series, and that was just wonderful for me, for my own uh, personal experience and, 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 and learning from and having um, members of delegations in the UN just tell me I was full of you know what. It was wonderful. <laughs> It was wonderful because you know that sometimes you, you need that kind of creative uh, reaction, you know, and attention. So anyway, I'll be turning the floor over to Colleen. Thank you, thank you very much, Bob and Ray, for the for the invitation to speak with you. And what I've done is, I, well, first of all, I found this conversation today incredibly interesting, and it's so um, kind of. Uh, enlightening to hear how many parts of the same system uh, can come together or sometimes don't and how these opportunities really lend themselves for exchanges amongst yourselves and I'm very uh, curious to know uh, what comes of this meeting and to what extent uh, I personally or the parts of the UN with which I work uh, can support you in your in your endeavors to get a close relationship with the UN and different um, parts of the UN. Bless you. Uh, so I, I looked at the questions for, for this part of the agenda and I thought I would tackle two of them. And I'll tackle them a little bit um, indirectly. I shared uh, some handouts. I'm sorry for those who don't have them. I didn't have enough. But um, the first one is really how uh, faculty should effectively engage with the UN. And to talk about that, I was thinking about the question. I thought, you know, let's start by looking at what education and learning is at the UN. So what you have first is a, a, a handout, which is the UN system. And it's this chart. It's an unofficial chart the different parts of the UN system. And the second slide I very rudimentally put together last night, it's a crude slide, with just three um, clusters. And these are the three clusters, part of this UN system, that are the ones that deal with learning. And learning in the UN system is generally training and research. So that's how we distinguish between the teaching side and the research side. Interestingly, in the UN, you don't really talk about teaching because you're really focused on adult learners, and so you try and talk about learning or transfer of knowledge um, rather than teaching. But for all intents and purposes, it's training and research, which we also call learning. And what you'll see is that there is a, um, an element, a, a, a strand of, of training and research that goes through all of the, um, you know, the principal organs, including the UN Secretariat. In other words, there will be individuals or even small departments within departments that deal with some aspect of training and, and research. And um, the same is the case in the area of the cluster of the funds, agencies, and programs. Some of them that we can talk about today, WHO, UNICEF, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then you have another cluster here that we haven't spoken about today, and I think I'll spend a few minutes explaining it, and that is what at the UN we call the training and research family, the family of institutes that are the, dedicated to training and research. And there, in fact, there are seven of them. There were originally eight. One of them, uh, somebody mentioned, I believe Michael mentioned UNIFEM, and uh, UNIFEM was the, the, the Institute for Training of, uh, on Gender Issues that was based in San, uh, Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic, that was incorporated into UN Women. But the other seven institutes, one of them is my own, UNITAR is the oldest one, uh, established just at the time uh, when countries were starting to decolonize, and there was a real need for these new, newly established countries to get trained on how to represent their own countries at the UN. So as I was mentioning this morning, all the protocol issues around operating at the UN, how, for instance, as a country, preside over Security Council, how an individual <coughs> delegate draft a UN resolution, all of these base issues, and the substantive issues. You know, when I get to the table, how do I negotiate for my country, a landlocked state, um, access to water and issues related to water, as an example. So those main areas of work is what UNITAR has done. It's evolved over time, but that's essentially a lot of the work that's done. UNU is the UN University, headquartered in, in Tokyo, with 13 uh, research institutes around the world. And then there are, those are the two main ones, and then there are smaller ones uh, that deal with specific areas, uh, such as disarmament and uh, sustainable um, development, in Geneva, uh, with crime in, in, in uh, Torino, Italy, and finally on um, the staff college, the UN staff college, which is a training entity for UN staff, also based in Italy. So that, that's kind of the constellation of, of training entities, uh, training and research entities within the UN. And why I, in, in starting you know, with this introduction, talking about this family of training institutes, is because that's the perspective from which I've worked uh, for many years now, for 15 years. And the next statement I'm going to make may surprise you, uh, coming from the vantage point of training and research, and it's to say that despite the, and I think it's a soft norm, Michael, it's despite the, what's called the global competence, one of the five competencies of the UN, which is a continued commitment to learning, despite the fact that there's this emphasis on a continued commitment to learning, the organizational culture of the UN, per se, does not, um, invest in uh, knowledge as a, um, I shouldn't say knowledge as a virtue, but in the, in the area of educating and the area of understanding new innovations in pedagogy. What you will find in the UN system, the UN technocrats, are experts on, are subject experts. These people are generally not pedagogical experts, they're not experts in training, and they haven't been trained in, 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 that, in that area. And I can say that with confidence because, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, managing the, the, the training uh, chapter for a large World Bank project, where what we've done is brought, uh, is brought faculty, and uh, Steve and I were speaking this morning, faculty, one of them being the dean of the School of International Service at American University, who I didn't even know what his expertise is. In fact, I purposely didn't want to know. I just heard him talk about learning innovations in pedagogy, how to, you know, a proper assessments, understanding your audience, um, incorporating new technologies into learning, how you really establish um, um, communities of practice over time, embedding, um, you know, understanding when a capacity development intervention is the right approach to a particular challenge. Um, all of these issues are, are, are kind of, you know, are not systematically considered when capacity development and, and training efforts are um, designed within the UN system. And so uh, Patrick Jackson is one example of someone who brought on board and within a particular community of practitioners, in this case migration practitioners, IOM, OS, um, OECD, UN, UNESCO, many people came together and everybody around the table said, this is the first time we've been able to speak about how to learn, not what to learn. And it's been so useful for us to do that. So, and I, I start with this introduction because one thing that we haven't spoken about today is the comparative advantage that you have as faculty when it comes to you know, how you're conveying knowledge. Not that only what you're conveying, but how you're doing it. And how you're doing it in a way where you can show and you can reflect impact on people's, on people's attitudes, on, on, on eliciting tacit knowledge, on the value of peer-to-peer -peer learning, 
on, uh, you know, on how most of the acquired knowledge takes place outside the classroom when you come together it's really to exchange information. Um, because at the UN it's, it's still being done as if it were 1960. You know, the lecture hall is where you expect the change to take place and people really understand what's going on. So consider that, you know, that as you're packaging why it's important to engage with you vis-a-vis -vis any part of the UN, that you also have um, the track record and the expertise in conveying information, how you convey the information. That's my first point, and we have one more. Um, <laughs> the other one goes back to what Jeremy was saying earlier about you know, the two types of information. The type of information that is almost executive information, um, you know, what needs to be known quickly um, in a format that is readily digestible, sometimes that is universally applicable, so somebody can really right, now, right away understand how you might be talking about one country, but you're explaining how that might also apply to other countries or what the implications would be for other countries, kind of the transferability of knowledge when you're talking to a multicultural um, audience. All of those issues, it's what we call you know, ex executive knowledge, and a lot of what UNITAR does. And I would say that that is, what's important about executive knowledge is how you do it. You know, it, you need to you need to get rid of the academic jargon. You need to, you know, explain why it's important now. Explain the connections. Um, come right up with the policy prescriptions, even if you are challenged, as Ray was saying, by some of the people in the room. Mm -hmm. And then the other category of knowledge is that one where sit back and you know develop a thorough longitudinal study or come up with data sets that are going to be really useful. And I would argue that I was just listening to the last presentations and say that that's, you know, in the UN context, that type of longer term, just as important research, in fact, that often is from what you, you draw for the executive knowledge, is really, should be connected to the UN in such a way that you're really looking at the processes. You know, it's more of a, that, that, that um, evidence base is more of a when question. When do I... Um, intersect with the UN at a time where they're going to care about what I have to say based on this research that I've been developing over time. And it's not complicated because there are so many processes in the UN, whether it's the climate change and the COP in Paris or UN Habitat, anybody working on sustainable development issues, Quito next year. You know, there's a whole calendar of processes underway. Rio, we were talking about it in the book. Look at where you can interject over the long term in this convening role that the UN plays, where it will need to support what is said, being what is being said by that the, the, the by the academic and empirical evidence that you as faculty have, you know, the time and, and also the expertise to develop. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I have an immediate uh, question, but uh, I'll, I'll let it go if somebody else wants to. Uh, let me just, just start off here. In terms of the initial uh, discussion here of engaging um, in, in the role of UNITAR as uh, um, working on the skills of uh, the diplomatic community, particularly from um, the context of decolonization, and that's that kind of need that's been identified. But one of the things I was wondering about, this came up actually in conversations with colleagues about uh, our, our new masters of international affairs, um, and, and and I didn't have the answer right off that. I have to go I'll, I'll look it up, and maybe somebody can help me here. In terms of diplomatic visas, so uh, our people who are uh, in the delegations, uh, members of the delegations, are there any restrictions on what they can do in terms of learning and how uh, they do it? So, for example, auditing classes at Columbia, I guess, is okay. But is it possible for them to take classes and you know uh, get an executive MBA or whatever, something like that? Is that doable? Is that something that's also permissible from the stand of, stance of their uh, member states? Because you know, next thing you know, they've got that the degree and then they're off teaching at, at SUNY. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a loss of human capital, right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, what's the how? Able are we able to engage the diplomatic community in this? I don't know, Michael, you might have something to say about that. Yeah. I, yeah, I would say the only constraint that I've faced, and it's been a very direct constraint, is not so much about uh, delegates as students, so to speak, but it's been about our choice of curriculum 
vis-a-vis mm. -vis how some countries perceive what we're developing as content. So I'll give the ex I'll just tell everybody what it was. Um, are we are being filmed? Uh, we we organized a number of um, of uh, seminars around the issue of um, genocide and. Two countries withdrew funding from from UNITAR for um, the content of the seminars and for some of the claims that were being made by external independent experts and brought it up in the General Assembly. Wow! So they cut their whole UNITAR budget basically. It, it wasn't a huge amount, but, but it's a symbolic. And, and they 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 chose yes. the General Assembly <laughs> as the yeah. place to to talk about how. Our, our, um, the, this was a long time ago, but how the uh, curriculum, the, the courses, the, the content of the course was biased. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one other element that is relevant I think, to all our universities uh, is not so much the international officials as students, but as potential teachers. Many of them come from academic backgrounds mm -hmm. and are very good teachers and like to teach. And so for universities that are relatively close, there's a, a wonderful resource mm -hmm. for a one-off class by someone who can do very good work. But just to warn you, there's a real landmine there because of the visas that the international officials come in on, the diplomats mm -hmm. and the uh, secretariat people, that makes it almost impossible for them to take a regular teaching position. Right. Uh, they can come in and give a guest lecture, <laughs> but they can't be paid. And if they can't be paid, they can't be a regular teacher in most of our institutions. Yeah. So they're great resource people, but and many of them will come and volunteer yeah. to give a class. And I had a good friend who prepared an entire syllabus just to discover he couldn't teach it. Oh, it was very sad. Yeah. And so, but just to warn you, they yeah. look very tempting to have them come in and teach a class for you, but it's only one off is all that seems to work. Mm -hmm. Can their research expenses be paid? <coughs> I'm sorry, the travel expenses. Uh, Oh, not. I, we tried at Columbia, and the answer is no. But there is a way to get around that, I've been told. Um, but it's not easy. Mm. And it's because, again, the GP system. Yeah. And you know, this was part of what the UNAI is supposed to be able to facilitate, is precisely having uh, people from the UN, you know, go to Oswego if, if I mean, that was how I understood it. Right. They, they can, but you, teaching, I mean, they can go to lecture. Right. Yeah. Lecture. Right. And One also, off, right. if, you are, if you are from the UN, um, for example, if you get one of the UN speakers, they don't get, they don't get paid. They come at the travel cost to your, um, right. to your campus. So anybody, diplomats, I'm not sure about, but the, the UN secretariat workers, yeah. we don't pay them any, yeah. um, they don't, Except, what do you call that? Um, honorary. 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 Honorary, yes. Yeah. How competitive is it to, to, to get them? I mean, you know, for those of us on the Western fringes, I think um, You know, again, I, it might be easier to do a Skype kind of yeah. uh, connection, yeah. but um, uh, it's, you know, it can, it can Can't vary hurt. depending on who's working that day right. at the UN unit, unit, group units, mm -hmm. um, and whoever is reading your, because they have a lot of demand on their time. Mm -hmm. so. But Jeremy, I will say when I received the request from Monroe, uh, I put a call down to DPI and I had a speaker the next day. So you know, so you have abandoned that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> last year we had we had by extension. <laughs> last year we took about a month to get someone. This year we took about um, two days. So it might be the staffing difference now. Mm -hmm. They they might have had. They were losing staff, DPI was leaving, and then they were replenishing some of the staff, so maybe they're mm -hmm. back to good shape now. And I will say that I think what's happening here is we're starting to get noticed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, They're having a sense that SUNY is making a commitment. Yeah, I don't think it was an accident. We had put in uh, a request, I had written a request for the Chancellor to uh, the Secretary General to come and speak at Rockefeller College. And um, the initial response, and I was telling Michael this, mm -hmm. and, and this should come as no surprise, um, the Secretary General has a lot on his schedule, right? <laughs> uh, so, but the immediate response was, the Secretary General is very interested in this, we'll get back to you. And then Syria, and then, you know, and then half of Africa, then, you know, at, at the crisis of the day. And I got back in contact, and, and 
you know, they said he is interested, we just can't make a commitment, and you know, it's just kind of spun out of control. But um, but I will say that, you know, then subsequently, after we had extended the invitation to the Secretary General, then surprise, surprise, the Chancellor is invited as the only woman academic in, in the world to be uh, invited to be a member of the board of UN Women. So, you know, I think what's happening here is there's a clear sense that we are trying to do something special here. So, you know, I think to the extent that the Sunni imprimatur can be put on it, um, it, it may it may help things. Yeah. You know, you know, one thing that I was also the, the, when you mentioned the the kind of rhythm and the cycle and uh, uh, initial when. I like, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, we have our, we work on our projects, we produce our paper, and then, you know, here, it's, it's the win for us, right? You know, we're ready to uh, send it out to the policymakers and that they should listen, right? Or they should be interested. But it's a matter of thinking about your audience and when your audience is, is prepared for that. And that's, I think, partly a matter of, uh, I don't know how to put it, but I guess intelligence gathering about when those windows of opportunities uh, exist. What, I mean, other than major conferences and, and that thing, what are the other ways of determining when? And then the other thing I was thinking about with uh, UNAI is that this is something that our cooperation could potentially help institutionalize. Um, so just a, a thought there, but I don't know, I'll just follow up on that. Yeah. I mean, to follow what Michael was saying over lunch, you know, when is right now for anybody who's a development <laughs> expert because yeah. there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, it's just, it's really just the start. And it's also at the national level, so um, anybody in the development world, it's, it's right now. You know, um, people with, with solid empirical evidence and, and kind of points of view should be, should be trying to sh share, them, share them now. Um, and, you know, these conferences, um, the, there are these specific conferences in other fields where um, um, there are different approaches. One of them is to going through the, the secretariat that supports the process, so more, whether it's like the World Humanitarian Summit, which will be in Istanbul in, in, next, in 2016, in March, I think, or others where you, you, know, you can see through the secretariat, but other times it's just also um, reaching out to G77 countries. You, know, you guys are in Europe, so close to the UN, and all of these missions, I mean, there's a joke uh, that I heard when I first arrived in New York uh, at the UN, and then I realized it wasn't a joke, and it was the ambassador who isn't there when a very important vote is taking place, and uh, his colleague catches up with him, uh, another ambassador, and says, where were you? And uh, he finally says, well, I'll tell you, but please don't tell nobody else. And he, goes, and he, he was moonlighting as a taxi cab. And so the capacities of some prohibitions, yeah. and I think that there's still some truth in that, um, you know, if not more than there, there was a little while ago, uh, the, there's just a huge shortage of capacities that you will see a lot of uh, nationals from other countries um, providing substantive support and kind of, you know, human resource personnel in missions. So if you can get creative and, 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 and share, um, you know, share your interests and um, know that it's a relevant time for them and that it's really going to help them out. Not think that it might, but you already know that it's going to help them. You'll be doing, mm. you can, you know, you can be doing that huge service, and they can also be doing your service. So I, I want to, can I just mention? Uh, well, I, I forgot to mention in kind of opening remarks um, something else that I want to say about the training and research world, um, which is that, uh, like so many other parts of the UN, there have been efforts to make it better. And um, you know, over the decades, there's kind of been a review of the mandates, and then there was you know UN reform, and could was, was the training and research family low hanging fruit to improve? Start let's start with these entities and see what we can do. Um, and it really hasn't borne much fruit in the sense that there has been no almost no consolidation. There have been a few things. That, for instance, the head of Unitard now the head of the staff college, and a few a few steps, but but not much. The other big challenge for the training and research family outside this consolidation issue and kind of rationalizing why all these institutes exist is how can they do their job better? And their job should really is to service the operational side of the UN. And we were saying this morning that the operational side is becoming more and more important for the UN, and there's a big push under the current Secretary General and Darlene Future as well 
for the operational part to 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 to, um, to expand, you know, over the kind of the people who are at headquarters. Um, and I think that the training and research um, world, you just have to look at the website, it's a particular view and you. Um, is struggling with this issue. You know, they are, they're also quite siloed in the research that they do and trying to figure out how it can be used by the people on the ground and, you know, have those bridges and so that they're really helping with their research, those who are, who are doing the work. So I just wanted to address picking up on Colleen's comments but also back to a question that Ubu had addressed this morning, and that is, how do we get the research of our faculty out in front of the UN? Um, last year, we had convened a conference on MOOCs in the developing world. It was a joint conference between UNAI and us, and we had brought, uh, brought in uh, those who follow MOOCs, and not Agrawal, it's the, one of the founders and now the CEO of edX, and we also brought in somebody senior from Coursera, and then a MOOC user the president of the college in India. Uh, actually, that was somebody who, uh, who UNAI had provided. Um, we were put in one of the conference rooms that fit about 500 folks, which is somewhat standard. And, and we had 175 people committed as a result of our outreach, mostly higher education folks from the New York metro area. And I was a little bit concerned, you know, because you're, you have a room for a 500 people, you have 175 people in the audience. I felt that we had a strong group of presenters. We had 250 walk-ins from the UN community that day, so we had about 420 folks all together. So clearly we delivered a product that was of interest to them, and uh, it had a global audience. We were getting actually Q&A in from around the world while the program was going on. And it really, it's interesting, a previous program that we had done in human trafficking in conjunction with Albany Law, there I thought we kind of missed the mark because Albany Law had kind of seated the panel with its own instructors. And, and so, you know, where's the gravitas there? And, and I think that the UN community recognized that, uh, that we weren't bringing in world-class speakers, but we were with the second program. And so, you know, this is, again, another one of those opportunities where right now we're working with UNAI to put on something about uh, cybersecurity and international law for spring next year. And uh, that is another one of those themes where we brought it to UNAI and they said, this sounds really good. And, you know, we're reaching around the country as well as over to Geneva to, you know, to have a world-class panel. So, you know, to the extent that we have resources around the system, and sometimes those resources, we don't necessarily have to advance. We can't, we can't stack the panels with only our people and expect to have, to grab the attention, unless we're uniquely qualified in the world to talk about whatever the subject might happen to be. But there's an opportunity for our people to be involved in the organization and planning of the program. There's an opportunity for us to serve as uh, moderators of the panel. And there's an opportunity for us where you know the uh, the portfolio is distinctive to also serve on the panels as well, and so you know it's something that we can take a look at, and that takes it right down to the UN, and it gives us an opportunity to you know, to get the message and the research out there. So just thinking about that in terms of opportunities, and this is where it's not necessarily um, SUNY system, but if you think about your own work. And uh, if in your own networks on a specific topic, uh, if, and this is what happens, I encourage, for example, uh, graduate students to do this, is organize panels for the big meetings with uh, leading scholars, because quite frankly, they're probably not going to organize them themselves. They're hap happily will join something that somebody else organizes. So you can use that same kind of way of uh, Yes, it's more volunteer work, but at the same time, uh, can also uh, enable you to um, maybe bring people that you know together, and then maybe because it's going to be at the UN, get additional practitioners and some others to really round it out. Um, and of course, by organizing and being one of the one of the people involved, uh, promote your own work. <laughs> so that's just a thought on how to potentially use this. And sometimes it, it seems to me that a, that a good way, and I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but a lot of the 
if you're, if you're doing policy relevant work that you think other people ought to hear who are in the UN system, one of the common ways to go at that is, is indirectly through the NGO system. Mm -hmm. um, because there's an awful lot of subcontracting that happens, and there's all these NGOs that drift around the UN and they're trying to sort of relay a message on certain sorts of things. And mm -hmm. in, in my own case, sometimes working with outfits like the International Foundation for Electoral Systems has been ways to put has been a way to put things on the agenda within the UN mm -hmm sort of headquarters. So I don't know if you're working on issues where there is an NGO connection and those NGOs have good reputations at the institution. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's important. Yeah, that's, that's important. really important because that can, that can cut you short. Cut you short exactly. You know, cut, and, uh, mm -hmm. cut you short very yeah. quickly if you're associated with, with um, the screen. Wrong NGO. I mean, I thought you were going to say yeah. through an IGO. You know, for instance, since you mentioned IOM, or yeah. if, you, if you go through an intergovernmental organization yeah. as a way to have a voice, a platform, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the member states, mm -hmm. um, that's probably better. Yeah, yeah. And, and, not, and then there are NGOs that are great, um, but you have to definitely be careful, I think. Questions, comments? People tired? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it, you know, that being the case, um, what I'm just going to suggest is, is a little after 4.30, we can accelerate things by moving to a wrap-up wrap session here that Ilgu will uh, lead us in. And I'm seeing the setup here going for our, uh, our reception. So we'll start that a little early and, and, uh, and, and get everybody to have a chance to have a bite. So the wrap-up is going to be very impromptu, right? So we, but I do have this, this one chart uh, from SUNY Model EU. This is outdated. Um, uh, so, Johannes, don't take this as like this is what's going on. Right? <laughs> this, was a, this was a proposal uh, that the Europeanists in, in the SUNY system had put together uh, for a, um, it, it was done as a part of a grant uh, proposal that went to the European Union um, and we were one of the finalists, but the grant didn't come through. But this was uh, imagined as all of the Europeanists in um, in the uh, Sunni system. They what they're doing is they're facilitating research that focusing on the EU. So we can actually translate that into the United Nations, right? Our mission could be uh, we are going to try to facilitate as much research as possible in the context of the. Sunni um, about the UN, um, supporting and promoting and teaching of um, United Nations at the undergraduate, graduate, and professional levels, um, serving as a network of um, UN specialists throughout Sunni, but also we can think about serving as specialists at the UN um, because of our uh, knowledge network at Sunni and also um, promoting uh, outreach to the constituencies served by Sunni units, and also um, identifying and pursuing resources to um, ensure sustainability of UN programming throughout Sunni. So this was a mission, and I think that this mission is pretty much what we've been discussing today, and how do we make this really happen. And there is a teaching component, a research component, and one of the things that we've done today is kind of getting together through the conversations and sharing our research, but also sharing ideas about how we can do this at the, at the, um, at the system level. Um, so I guess uh, what we have talked about and some of the ideas that are coming out from today that I will try to summarize uh, that are standing out for me is encouraging a Sunni-wide um, cooperation under a UN concentration um, and, and making that happen um, with the support of Sunni Central so that we have some kind of a, a common understanding of what a Sunni United Nations certificate uh, study would look like. So we might have to kind of flush out what that needs to look like among the people who are involved in the process. Um, and we can talk about also a platform where um, 
all SUNY campuses can share information about the activities that they are actually doing. And by signing on to UN Academic Impact, kind of streamlining that process, um, if you can make that possible on your campus, having a point person through the UN Academic Impact helps us identify who is going to be that one person on campus that collects all this information and puts it together. Um, I mean, that person would not necessarily have to be responsible for doing all the activity, but they would kind of be abreast to all the information that is coming from different parts of campus. Um, so those are things that can be done with ease, I think, uh, without having to have super commitment. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the things that we can, we can set out um, uh, to go. Uh, we should talk about getting more students down to the UN and getting the UN to campuses. And we have kind of discussed some of the ways that can happen really easily. It's just a matter of um, finding the right people at the UN. I would be happy, again, um, I'm going, Bob, can I volunteer you as well? Uh, Bob uh, is, is the point person who can actually put you in touch with people at the UN to be able to do that so that you can increase UN programming at, on your campuses as well. Uh, I guess those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. Am I leaving anything out? Um, uh, oh, oh, uh, and then um, the synchronous distance learning class with Open SUNY was one of the things that we talked about, right? Um, so that's a um, that's potential for kind of identifying who's doing the work at, throughout SUNY um, and putting together all of that um, top-notch work into kind of a class setting where all SUNY students can take advantage of. Um, uh, going back to the issue of research, um, identifying some of the research that is happening on campuses and see how that can be UN relevant, um, um, especially with some of the specialized uh, research like the Global Health Institute, uh, but on other campuses also if there is um, research going on on uh, the legal aspects of UN Framework Convention on climate change, how do we make that a part of um, the UN process and uh, the research at the UN? And that already exists. How do we communicate that to the UN and to the world through the UN academic impact? So what we're doing is we're kind of identifying those uh, contributions and putting them together so that we can make it more visible to the rest of the world. Um, and, and we have information that we can share with each other that, oh, that information exists at Sunni so State. How do we get there? Um, so uh, I guess um, that's what I have. I'd like Anything to, else to add? I'd like to chime in. Yes, please, please. A couple please, of please. Uh, takeaways that I have. Um, first off, that particular project, that endeavor, um, was in response to a call for proposals yes. from the, uh, the, the EU delegation in Washington. So there was this you know, call for proposals and they have these various centers. Now, I'm, I don't know. I mean, is, is there something, some foundation, some, uh, you know, somebody out there, uh, you know, the, there's the United Nations Foundation, I don't think this is necessarily what they do. Um, and and uh, I mean that would sound like it, but if, if there were, um, you know, that that would be something to think about collectively pitching uh, to some external funder. But again, it could be, um, you know, potentially uh, something that perhaps the right alum uh, might be interested in investing in, um, and, uh, and and that's another way of going about it. But I think we come back to this problem of resources and. Um, there has to be a way of, of, of doing that. Part of what happened, what made that possible too, was Mitch Leventhal and the, uh, the SUNY Global Center. We, there is a wonderful facility. I don't know if you, if you all have been there uh, to, to visit and been there for a meeting, et cetera, but you know, there it is. And uh, the question is, is to the extent to which we could leverage that uh, that building, uh, the rooms that they have, and the proximity. Having a center uh, for 
you know, United Nations studies uh, would be an amazing um, venue for that. You know, yeah. just having um, students in there, having researchers in there, having, I mean, that was like the vision that you can have in, for that building is amazing, but um, there is no room right now because um, Chancellor has moved in there uh, and, and so did well, Carl McCall. Not exactly. Um, <laughs> not exactly. I mean, it is, and there are, you know, there's, it's being used there's, no, office, there's, there's no, no office, office space. space. Exactly. There's no office space. Yes. There, well, is, like, there are rooms that are being rented out yes. um, to venues. Like my program, we rent out the rooms there. Right. Um, so there, there is room to rent out. Right. So if we have the right money, we money. could. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Once again, uh, but, but if there are those kinds of resources to be able to, I mean, for example, uh, we're going to use, uh, our plan is now for SUNY Global for the Masters of International Affairs program, so we will have classes in the Global Center, and we'll be using synchronous distance learning, video conferencing to connect <coughs> students in Albany, et cetera. Um, and you know, the question is if there could be programmatic events that uh, uh, could utilize the global classroom, for example, uh, 110 uh, people at its seats. Those are all the kinds of things. But again, they require uh, the fundraising. Not course. always. Um, um, it is possible, because we, we put on programs there, and we don't pay for it. Oh. Um, but I think that's. <laughs> I think that because we work somewhat directly for the chancellor, we're able to do that. And so I would be willing to have the conversation with Alex Cartwright, <laughs> with Alex to ask him if we could get special dispensation because this is doing exactly what the chancellor wants us to do. You know, I think if something is institutionally based and, and it's a profit center, you know, there's money coming in, uh, for tuition for that particular class, I'm sure they look at it differently than if all of a sudden it's a system-wide integrated effort to bring attention to SUNY's global programming. We, we have been able to get some discount in the use of the rooms, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they do um, comp um, our end of the year events we haven't had to pay for and so there's a couple of things that we can do there that we haven't paid for but as far as the room use you have to pay right. rent um, in a discounted rate yeah well it was just uh, two things that come to mind um, in terms of you know because we're we've been talking about how SUNY can um, promote its wares to the UN and just from the other side you know how can um, how can you be appealing to the UN um, in terms of some of the services the UN requires that it doesn't have? Mm -hmm. One of them is space. Um, there are so many parts of the UN that need to have conferences. And um, um, so, for instance, as I was mentioning, of the 193 permanent missions, I would guess that only a dozen have a conference room, the German mission, a few others of these gorgeous conference rooms. But um, you know, to the extent that you're working with permanent missions because you have resources that are relevant to their countries, and you have a conference room that you, they can use to co-organize meetings on strategic issues. In fact, let me give you guys, I, I should have done this earlier, but um, the government of um, Finland um, uh, thought that some brilliant ambassador woman thought that it would be a really good idea once they were no longer a, had a they, once they no longer had a seat on the Security Council, because they were one of the non-permanent five, and they were rotated off, that why wouldn't they continue the good tradition that they had done as um, as new members to invite all of the incoming members to a briefing on how the Security Council works. So in Terrytown, every year, they would organize this briefing for the Security Council new members, but of course they would invite the, um, the five who were still remaining, the five non-permanent who were still there, and the five um, permanent members. And so in effect, they were having a meeting every year on the most important matter before the Security Council, all of the ins and outs on what the issues were last year that nobody knows about except everybody in the room, and they were the ones convening the meeting. So there's a lot of value in offering your services as a venue. In Terrytown. Well, this was Terrytown, but I mean, yeah. SUNY Global, I've been to SUNY Global, yes. and that, okay. if that's high state, I mean, that, that, that would be great. That, that's a really, really good um, 
um, opportunity that you know, they yeah, have a lot of interest in knowing. And, and that's permanent missions would have interest, as would um, um, parts of the UN system that do not have conference rooms. I mean, I'm thinking um, some of the smaller agencies that have a representational office in New York, I get the World Intellectual Property Office, uh, um, you know, and there are all sorts of ones that they just didn't have, don't have it. They right. use the church center when they can. Right. But if they knew about SUNY Global, then, and then you, you're on the in, you know, of their conversations while you were. And actually, to Colleen's point, uh, we had a board meeting down in the boardroom at SUNY Global yesterday, mm -hmm. and UNICEF Canada was down in the whole classroom. They, mm -hmm. they were booked in for three days, so the word's getting out. That's good. And the other point I just wanted to make, and you may, might be familiar, I know I sent it to you Bob, a while ago, an example of a UN wire. Um, so there's a dispatch of the serve in the UN, anybody, you know. Um, and I've noticed that graduate programs are using it more and more. Um, so you can advertise a, a relevant graduate program through the UN system, meaning it definitely goes to all UN technocrats. I don't know if it goes to the, to the government delegates, um, although they would hear word of it as well. Um, and you might even find a way of putting it on the electric UN journal. Um, so you can shamelessly advertise programs really much more easily than you could in the past. And, and it seems like some are in, the, in, are in the know, and they don't want the other universities to know because it's well, always the same university. Thank you very much for this bit of uh, <laughs> intelligence. Um, it's really helpful. But and just following up on the suggestion that you made or implied here is that um, if there were to be opportunities, and I think, again, it's identifying um, those member states that uh, with the missions don't have conference rooms, very kitty, <laughs> having them um, introduced to the facility through a meeting that any one of us might convene, perhaps, in collaboration with UNAI, uh, might be, again, mutually beneficial to SUNY Global uh, as well as the, the various missions. And it's those kinds of connections that then open the door to you know, uh, things like we were talking about before, uh, getting access and, and, and badges and, and getting students internships, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, another person who is really great with this is Ali Mazzara. Yes. Yeah. At the um, yeah. So we should definitely involve her in the discussions that we're having because yeah. she knows a lot of people at different missions as well. Um, yeah. So. And and Ali had uh, wanted to uh, come but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. couldn't and and she will will definitely um, uh, debrief her. If I can get a minute, just. Loop. We were talking about trying to bring people in maybe virtually or trying to host events with other SUNY campuses where you have people joining. The other half of my summer responsibilities uh, have been working with Ray on online learning for Rockefeller College. Um, and, and he's conducting the Masters of National Affairs program. We're going to have a classroom in New York City and a classroom here. Um, and the software tool that we think that we're probably going to use, we found the most useful is Z O O N. Um, and it has a lot of the same features as, as Skype, but also has some of the classroom features like a Blackboard Connect. Um, but what we found is it has a pretty easy to use interface. Um, so if you wanted to have a guest lecturer come in, provides a nice interface, you can record things. So if you want to be able to show it to a classroom after you've recorded an interview with somebody. Um, and then you can also have as many users as you need. So if you have 10 different classrooms um, and 10 different campuses all invited, you can all just have um, have an invite sent out just from one user account. And it's actually only $10 a month for their normal pro account. And then if you get the educational platform for like a, a college or a department, it actually gets done to as low as like $5 a month per account. But you only need the host to have an account. Um, so to the extent you're trying to co um, collaborate online or try to bring in people that are not physically able to attend, it's a tool you might want to look into um, that's better than Skype as far as some of the hardware limitations. Um, you can give PowerPoint presentations through the software itself instead of, as you saw today, I was clicking through yeah. Forgren. Um, so it, it, if multiple SUNY campuses are looking at the same software, it might help us collaborate together better than mm -hmm. all having different platforms, but just lending my uh, yeah. knowledge in that area. And, and, you know, <laughs> maybe uh, just to say, and, and maybe this we will use to uh, finalize things here and move on to um, having some refreshments. And that is, you know, next steps. We've got identified a whole lot of uh, possibilities here. I think we'll try to distill some of this. Um, 
we have uh, recorded our, our thoughts <laughs> and our collective wisdom here that we go back to. Um, but uh, we, we can stay in touch, too. All right, so we'll begin with the easy things like the, the, the list of participants and the email addresses and then some of the folks who, who couldn't come. Um, but again, uh, you know, following up on, on what Ian said, Zoom is a really easy tool so that if subgroups here, if you've met someone and you've got an idea you want to pursue with a few people, um, to, to, to set up a, a meeting and, and circulate it to the others, you know, that here we're going to have this meeting, a, few, a handful of people, send it out to everybody else, and you might have a few other people join in, and, and it's, it is possible to do that. Um, I don't know how many you want to bring in. Zoom will handle up to 25. It's, it's kind of, I think that'd be, be difficult in terms of managing it. But a group of six or seven, um, uh, like a group Skype is, is... We've certainly had a lot less audio problems than with Skype as far as we tested it in multiple yeah. classrooms and had no feedback issues with a microphone open to the whole classroom. Yeah. Um, and some people were calling in. It also interfaces with a phone call in. So if someone doesn't have access to a computer at the time, um, or having internet difficulties, they can just call in and join your meeting and know that everything else is taking place online. Um, so it's actually a really flexible software. And, and actually, if you have a video conferencing room that has all the hardware for um, like the omnidirectional mics, the cameras that move to track people, it actually is developed to integrate into those systems. Um, so it's a, a pretty useful tool to, to look into if you're doing any kind of online learning or online collaboration. So uh, I, I suggest that, yes, please do. I wonder if it makes sense to have a committee that looks at the SUNY certificate and UN studies and meets this way and then reports back to us without us ever having to get back together again directly. I mean, it would give us a reason to communicate again. Yes. Um, and give us a concrete action plan, maybe, mm -hmm. to move forward with. And Bob would definitely have to be on that committee. <laughs> They'll go for sure. Yeah. And I don't know, you guys can decide later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since, since this was a wonderful suggestion. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not lobbying to be on the committee, and I don't know that I'm the best aid, you know, uh, best person for it because I don't teach on you. I teach uh, on human rights. But right. if you want me there, I'll be there. I just think it, it'll be something we ought to consider just to keep the discussion going. So why don't, why don't uh, maybe you and me and Ilgu talk to Jason and Sam. Mm -hmm. And then and then we can go on from there. Yeah. And uh, who else would be interested in, in investigating and exploring the possibility of developing such a certificate? Uh, OK. Jeremy? OK. <laughs> Robert? It's one of those things you volunteer for extra service, right? Yeah, this is exactly how it happens. <laughs> But I think it's a wonderful suggestion in terms of, uh, you know, it, I'm kind of somewhat skeptical in terms of the logistics of this. It may be a reach, but it's a good thing to when, have a reach. When you say that it has to go through SUNY Central, you sound like it would go to die. That's um, what I hear you say. Is that what you're let, me, let me tell you, uh, we started uh, our letter of intent, uh, the process to get a new master's program, uh, initially in 2009. And then, partly because of budgetary issues that had to be set aside. And then again, in 2012, and it was approved in um, this past June. So let's start so, now. So it, it's just, just to say, it's, let's, let's, it's a let's it's a eight to our 75th anniversary of the UN. There we go. So it's this just is a chance for a priority. Wouldn't yeah. you get fast track? So, I, I don't know about this, all right? A certificate's certificate. easier than a, a certificate's certificate. easier for sure. But even the Health and Human Rights Certificate, it, it took a while. It has to go through, uh, you know, campus governance, and maybe it's partly also, you know, that. Um, and then all the campuses. It would have to be right. all of the campuses. It would have to go through all of the campuses. See, I'm a big believer in top down. I don't. I don't <laughs> yeah. <I'm laughs> but David, what I hear you yeah. saying is. Is, it's the right thing to do. And it's yeah. the right thing to do. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think I mean, it can also turn it. some of your work that you're doing that's <coughs> not counting as service into work that the department's recognizing more officially if it's towards an actual certificate program that your department's offering. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's some return on investment there. Yeah. 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 
Well, Good. we could start a pilot maybe on our campus, given that we have all the, yeah. you know, yeah. so we can go and, over there. And then I also think that, um, I, I, just, I just think the program is, is incredible that uh, New Paltz has, and, 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 and to the extent to which we can um, uh, help uh, channel students there as a, as a study abroad option, as I put it, and then also any faculty members who might wish to you know, engage and learn. And again, that's the other item that I put on, and, and to think in terms of uh, release time and, and getting some resources for course development. Mm -hmm. so, release time would make it a bit more attractive. Yeah, I'm sure. Like yeah. Publish and stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but again, that's something that, that you can go to um, individual campus administration, and, and they're the ones with the first strings for things like that. But again, if, 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 if there's a, a larger cause, if there's a larger um, you know, momentum across the system, mm -hmm. that's also for them, it's a, it's a, good uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Look, with that said, I want to thank you all. I, I really especially want to thank the uh, Rockefeller Institute of Government staff, um, Joe and Mike, who have been here with us all day long. And behind the scenes, and, and having Michelle, and, and really uh, appreciate all the work that, that, that they've done to make, make our day just as productive as it's been. And thanks to you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. So we adjourn the reception.